عن اذا احتراما منا للوقت نبدا في الوقت المناسب بالضبط حتى لا نفيض على الوقت المخصص ونعتدي على وقت بقيه الجلسات وبقيه النظام اذا اهلا بكم جميعا نبدا اذا هذه الجلسه الاولى والتي سنشرع فيها في معرفة بعض أرجو منكم يعني طالما نتحدث عن الدروس المستفادة هناك دروس مستفادة أيضا من ندوات سابقة وهي أن تبدأ في موعدها وأن يجلس الجميع في أماكنهم يعني لا أريد أن ألعب دور المدرس ولكن اسمحوا لي ببعض السلطات حتى تكون الجلسة منظمة وفي مستوى الشخصيات المتميزة التي توجد في المنصة احتراما لها واحتراما للهيئة واحتراما للموضوع رجاء إذا سنبدأ هذه الجلسة من خلال تجربتين مهمتين في عمليات الانتقال الديمقراطي طالما هذه الندوة تتحدث عن دروس مستفادة نريد أن نعرف دروس مستفادة من تجربتي تشيلي وأندونيسيا أه سنستمع إلى أه السيدة الرئيسة ولو أننا في تونس نؤنس ولا نقول بالضرورة السيدة الرئيس السيدة الرئيسة أه رئيسة أه تشيلي السيدة فخامة الرئيس ميشيل باشليت ستتحدث عن تجربة بلادها ثم نمر إلى التجربة الأندونيسية مع فخامة الرئيس بهار حبيبي ثم نستمع إلى تعقيبين في الأثناء رجاء من كل شخص يريد أن يتقدم بسؤال أو استفسار أو توضيح يكتبه ويرسله إلى المنصة لن نفتح باب النقاش بشكل مفتوح سنستمع إلى كل هذه المداخلات وفي الأثناء أنا أتصل بالأسئلة وفي النصف ساعة الأخيرة سيكون هناك نقاش مفتوح استرشادا بالأسئلة التي وصلتنا منكم إذا أهلا بكم جميعا وآسف على هذه البداية القوية الحريصة على النظام وأطلب من فخامة الرئيس الرئيسة السيدة ميشيل باشليت أن تتفضل إلى المنصة تفضل Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this important seminar and share some reflections on the Chilean experience of returning to democracy in the late 1980s and early 1990s. But before entering into aspects of the Chilean transition, please allow me to a brief reflection on the title of this seminar, because it's indeed about pathways are not about a path to dependency. It is crucial to understand that the processes of social struggle and the transition to democracy are unique momentums for mending broken ties with the community, shaping institutions, and thinking about the country in the coming decades. Each country is unique and must be capable of a thorough self-examination in order to propose a new social and political contract with itself. When it comes to the transition to democracy, there is nothing worse than an adherence to imported models. Certainly, there are universal values that must be respected. The creation of a legal system that ensures human rights, holding periodic competitive and transparent elections, ensuring the greatest freedom of information, guaranteeing freedom of association, of assembly, and the freedom to form political parties, and so on. This is clear, but the final format of the transition, its timing, its emphasis, the institutions that will govern the process must come from each country itself and with the greatest participation of and in consultation with its civil society. The greater the participation of the entire community, the stronger the institution they build. And that is why I say that each society must know how to forge its own path. And Chile did that, and I think also this new Egypt will forge its own path. With respect to the Chilean process, a brief recapitulation. 
Chile had a long tradition of democracy prior to the coup d'etat in 1973. From the time the independent republic began in the early 19th century, presidential succession took place through periodic elections. The country experienced just one brief period of instability in the second half of the 1920s, but by 1932, it had returned to democracy. The early years of the 20th century also saw a dramatic increase in the political participation of the middle class, of workers, of people from rural areas, and beginning in 1949, of women as well. Chile's dictatorship lasted 17 years, from 1973 to 1990, and during that time, it wielded iron-fisted iron political and social control, and as a consequence resulted in a systematic violation of human rights, thousands of deaths, tens of thousands of cases of torture, and hundreds of thousands of people forced into exile. But in the case of Chile, we must speak about the process of democratic restoration, which is important to take into account because the country had a political and social fabric that served as a support for the process. In 1980, the dictatorship enacted a new constitution that specified that a plebiscite will be held in 1988 to consult the citizens on whether the regime should continue until 1997. And that produced a crucial turning point for the restoration of democracy. The opposition to the dictatorship decided to participate in the plebiscite and called the Chilean people to mobilize and vote no to the continuation of Augusto Pinochet in power. The results are well known. The no won, and Pinochet simply had no choice but to leave power a year later. So what would I say are the key lessons of our process? First try to achieve the unity of democratic forces all along the route to be taken. Up until 1982 or 1983, the opposition to Pinochet was splintered into various groups. All fights between political parties resulted in diverse exit strategies for transitioning from the dictatorship. But the only thing that division among democratic forces does is strengthening non-democratic forces. Only as of 1984 did the process of dialogue and reorganization of the opposition around a common process begin. And it wasn't easy. My party, for example, joined the opposition strategy toward the end of 1987. But when it did, it came to the process with large grassroots and youth sectors. What is important is that it took an enormous amount of political work to reach this procedural agreement. The transition required thousands of political meetings, thousands of seminars. It meant traveling throughout the country, meeting with social leaders and union leaders, and convincing them to accept the strategy. At first, we did not even agree on how to govern once we returned to democracy, but the process in our case of defeating dictatorship through election was clear. That shows the importance of political leadership. Demonstrations may arise spontaneously, and that is good, but the process and the future democratic government will not. They need to be led. Second, agree upon the constitutional rules of the transition. In the Chilean case, there was negotiation with the military government after the plebiscite of 1988, and before the regime left power in order to reform certain aspects of the constitution that limited popular sovereignty. And it was upon that base that the posterior democratization was built. I want to clarify a point. We may or may not like these rules. As a matter of fact, I have to say, I did not like at the time those rules. We can argue whether these rules are more legitimate or less. Remember that in our case, and you have a different situation, because you are in a fantastic momentum, because you can build a new constitution, new system. We inherited a constitution. So in our case, the legal foundation for the transition was Pinochet owns constitution. But what is essential is a framework that defines the territory, one that allows progress towards the normalization of the democratic institutionality. I want to insist, we can argue about the groundwork, but it is essential to have a foundation that ensures that a government is reasonably 
polyarchal, to use an expression from political science. In an ideal design, countries would decide upon certain basic aspects of functionality as they build a constitutional framework for the transition, defining, for example, a calendar of the entire democratization process from the highest executive power to local authorities, or the form of government, whether presidential, parliamentary, or mixed, the size of the legislature, the electoral system, the definition of district boundaries, and the design of an electoral process that ensures transparency, and also electoral systems of justice. This, in addition to the basic values of all democracies that I mentioned earlier, political parties, freedom of association, of assembly, of press, etc., and so on. Third, while we're doing this, we need to keep an eye on the long-term institutions. Anyone who thinks that the institutional standardization of a country is only about holding election is completely mistaken. Authoritarian governments leave their mark in many other institutions. Those who participate in this process must think of the normal functioning of institutions such as the judiciary, the armed forces, federal and regional governments, as the case may be, or, of course, its own bureaucracy. In Chile, for example, one of the fundamental tasks of the first democratic government was precisely to bring that standardization about, change laws, modify procedures, and designate new people in each institution, as well as the necessary measures to ensure transparency, best tool to fight and prevent corruption, to develop accountability system, and of course reform the public administration so you can ensure efficiency and effectiveness. And in certain areas, it had to yield temporary. For example, it is a mystery to no one that Pinochet continue as commander in chief of the army for eight years because it was stipulated in the constitution. But the ultimate goal of a democratic government is to achieve total obedience of the military to civil authority, which it was finally achieved. Fourth, and I have to tell you because I was Minister of Defense, so I always had that experience. Fourth, bear in mind that democracy is synonymous with peace. It is important not to forget that often in this process that the people have gone through long periods of instability and fear. The Chilean case is very exemplary. Public opinion studies done in the late 80s revealed that what the people most often said they wanted was to live once and for all in peace and tranquility. Our people suffered greatly under the dictatorship, and the last thing they wanted was for the political conflict to go on indefinitely. Therein lies a call for the democratic forces in two ways. One is to prevent the emergence of violence from any side, and two, to be able to assure peace and order under the new democratic government. Fifth, do not forget, and I think this is essential, and I know this is something that you, you have felt probably, do not forget that the people expect that democracy will also produce growth and well-being. Or if I might say it in a more simple way, democracy has to deliver. Because Chile's transition was one of the last in Latin, Latin America, along with Paraguay, we were able to observe the different experiences in other countries. And something that struck me from the beginning was the weakness and the, that a democratic government could have if the young democracy did not achieve reasonable levels of growth and well-being for the population. Don't be fooled by the democratic momentum at the beginning of the process. And let me share with you an anecdote in Chile. The slogan of the 1988 no to Pinochet campaign was happiness, happiness is coming. But shortly after the first democratic government began, some people were still disappointed because they wanted everything yesterday, of course. But then it started appearing graffiti around the capital that said happiness never arrived. So because democratic recovery is an epic endeavor, it generates commitment in young people, it generates social movement, for me, the day that the no won in 1988 was just as moving as the day I won the presidency in 2006. But that epic heroism and commitment terminates in an ordinary democratic government, where there is bureaucracy, where there are problems that are difficult to solve, where there are negotiations in parliament, where sometimes things do not advance at the speed we would like, 
or as they said, from the poetry of the campaign, falls to the pros of the government. And so countries should be especially careful to create the conditions necessary for the new government to effectively exercise in its office from the very beginning, because otherwise, the public dissatisfaction with the government can turn into dissatisfaction with democracy. Sixth, do not forget that in the eyes of the people, democracy must be just. In this sense, democracy must know how to establish the truth, investigate and punish violation of human rights that occurred in the past, and create the necessary mechanism for reparation. I know that this can feel and see controversial. In some countries, the initial option was to turn the page. There have been many full stop laws in different places. But I have to tell you that the strength of justice was greater. And in many cases, even though they started that way, those positions were reversed. Democracy should know how to bring about justice because there is a reason that it is an ethically superior way to govern. In the Chilean case, I have to tell you, the route took several years, nearly 10. It began with a commission for truth that established the fact as they really occur, and little by little, the courts of justice advance. Because democracy is the enemy of revenge, of vengeance, progress in matter of human rights must always be made within a framework of the rule of law, although sometimes it can take time. But democracy is also about representation of the society. And, that, and also raises the issue of pluralism and inclusiveness. It is the representation of the whole society. So let me bring something here. Women and girls and young women who were in Tahir Square cannot be left aside in the process of transition. And now I'm speaking about as former president but also as executive director of UN Women. So I call upon uh, women has to be part of the reshaping of your society and in the reshaping of your constitution, in the reshaping of your institution. And I have to tell you good news because Egyptian women are working very hard on that. And yesterday they had a national convention meeting where they developed the Egyptian women charter that I have here, but I'm not able to read it because it's a little bit long, but where Egyptian women want to partner in the revolution, but also in building democratic Egypt. And they are asking for a fair representation for international, considering international convention to think on social and economic rights and how, how it can be avoided and change all discriminatory legislation against women and also how women can be important in judiciary policy and how to strengthen national women machinery so women's rights and empowerment can be as important as other issues and of course how it's important that it's a national policy so the media can also reflect those needs. And finally, I have, well, of course I would say it's very important the participation of civil society, of the youth, uh, because uh, it's very important that the revolution really reflects what the spirit was, what, the spirit of the revolution. And finally, in addition to thinking about democratic transition, it is important to consider how to strengthen democracy as well. A transition is much more than holding of election. The idea is for those processes to give rise to a healthy and vigorous democracy rather than simply ending with the election of a new government that could have autocratic tendencies. Therefore, it is important to give consideration to the way the process will become stronger over time. There is an issue of institutional strengthening, as I mentioned, but also one of promoting democratic values at every level and strengthening the participation of the people. Thank you very much. Shukra jazilan fakamt al-raisa Michelle Bachelet. Al-an namur ila tajriba ukhra rubbama khasiyatha anha tantani ila al-fada al-islami al-ladhi ربما له طبعه الخاص وقد تكون هناك بعض الإشارات المفيدة والدروس المستفادة لدول مثل تونس ومصر تفضل السيد الرئيس باهر الدين يوسف حبيبي الرئيس الأندونيسي السابق تفضل إلى المنصة
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Before I like to give you some information. First, about the similarity between Egypt and Indonesia. We both had a general on the top. Suharto was 32 years the prison, and in UK, 30 years. Second, they are very authoritarian. I'm not going to say dictators, very authoritarian. But you have some advantage. 99% of Egyptians are Arabs. 1% is maybe 0.6% is Greek, and the other is 0.4%. In our case, we, are, we have more than 500 ethnic groups having their own culture and language. I'm not exaggerating, more than 500. And we are all together 240 million people. 240 million people. But not only that, we are a pluralistic society. With a majority of Muslims. Eighty seven percent are Muslim, but we are not an Islamic state. We are a democratic republic of Indonesia. These are some input for you. Now let me describe about what happened. Please allow me to give you some information about how the transition to democracy in Indonesia has come about. The World Bank forecasted in its 1997 report an average economic growth for Indonesia of 7.8%. However, in the midst of the, this rapid growth, the economic crisis erupted in the middle of the, the year. The decline of the value of the bars, the currency of Thailand, was followed by a decline of the values of other currencies in quite a number of Southeast Asian and East Asian countries including the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and South Korea. All of these countries had economic structures that were not all that dissimilar from that of Thailand. They were all experiencing bubble economics. The crisis precipitated a flight of foreign capital from these countries and resulted in their banking systems collapsing one after the other. Bank Indonesia tried to apply various policies to defend the rupiah, but the monetary crisis accompanied by a collapse of inconfidence made the rupiah increasingly difficult to control. We had at that time, as I had to took over, the inflation rate of 78%. As I have to give, we had an inflation of 2%. And now we have a deflation. We are able to increase our GDP seven times. Now we have a GDP more than one trillion. We have a capital flight. 
No, it's coming. As the result of the monetary crisis, the Indonesian banking system could no longer function properly for a considerable period of time at that time. Thus, it was not possible to encourage growth in the real sector and business world. As a result, business at that time stagnated. I'm talking about that time. The supply of goods, especially essential commodities, was disrupted, including both of those intended for domestic consumption and export. As a result, a food and essential other commodities crisis became unavoidable. The situation upon rapidly out of control evolved into a prolonged multidimensional crisis that affected various fields. The effect of this crisis caused extreme hardship for the people, like here. Back here in the Middle East. The monetary crisis that hit Indonesia was a part of the domino, domino effect rippling out from the decline of value of the Thai bars against the US dollar. The peak of the crisis in Thailand was reached in December 8, 1997, when 56 of the country's 58 most important financial institutions were closed. Despite of the International Monetary Fund assistance since 8 of October 1997, the crisis afflicting business resulted in many companies laying off workers, leading to a massive increase in unemployment. The monetary crisis impact on an on unemployment in one year from 97 to 98 were as follows. Underemployment increased by 13.8 percent from 28.2 to 32.1 million people underemployed. Second, unemployment increased by 16.7 percent from 4.68 million to 5.46 million. All of these in turn led to social crisis as well as public disorder and security problems. Those who could not find jobs in the former sector in the end were forced to work in the informal sector, which suffered from much lower productivity levels. Public disquiet in fear became commonplace as the situation got worse. Indonesia, which had previously achieved macroeconomic stability, showed at that time 